see everybody, but hello, and thank you for attending. And uh, I appreciated the introduction because interestingly, I spoke with Phil Burgandy about Modesta Avila and he shared some of his concerns about uh, some of uh, the ways her story was interpreted. And uh, I'm not sure he was confident that I was gonna get it right, but I really appreciate learning after the fact that, that, that he felt that my paper uh, was valid. So that was a, a nice touch, appreciate it. So um, you, I hope you can all see my screen here. Uh, so we're gonna go through a PowerPoint on Modesta Avila, one of my favorite characters in local history. And I will tell you in advance, uh, I use her story not as an end in itself, <clears throat> I use it as a lens to understand more about the times, yeah. the pressures, uh, what it was like to experience it, um, and so forth. And in order to do that, her story had to be more accurate than it was, although it's, it, 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 her revised story is plenty interesting. So don't worry about that part, but there are some things that, that need to be um, pruned. <laughs> radically pruned actually. So, uh, so without further ado, let's, let's uh, go into uh, Modesta's story. And um, I'll start this, start it off with this. Um, this is a painting by the guy who did uh, Mount Rushmore, believe it or not. Um, and he, he came to California, fell in love with it. He actually wound up dying here. <clears throat> but um, he did this painting which uh, most of you will know that the Great Stone Church didn't look like that when he painted it because this was done in 1894. Um, but, and, and also there's no building high enough for him to have this perspective on, on the mission and the mission grounds. But uh, just to orient, we have Saddleback, which is the Blue Mountain in the back. If you can see that serpentine uh, area where, where the green is, that is Trabuco Creek. Um, and to our Lower right, we can't see it, but that would be no, San Juan Creek coming in. The sound is all the way up. Are you there? Can we hear you? Everybody yeah. there? Um, and um, we're going to come back to this house. This house is fictional, um, but, but from an orientation standpoint, this is approximately where um, the one of the two uh, Avila houses actually uh, was on, on the property that he, that the Avila family owned <clears throat> um, around the time of uh, the, the um, event of blocking the tracks. Okay, so we went through who I am. Um, I, did, I went through what Phil was going through. I went through all the original records and so forth. I didn't have to go to San Francisco, but there was a fair amount of work that had to be done uh, here locally and a lot of it was done through genealogical uh, resources. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, including things like land records, land grants, and so on and so forth, which were all, all discovered through that process. And then as far as the land records go, they are actually now housed in a, in a cellar in, uh, I believe it's Carson, but I, don't, don't quote me on that. It's, it's not a nice place, but it's, that's, that's where it is. And uh, so that's all on microfilm and so forth. Newspaper articles were a huge, huge part of the research uh, that went here. As a matter of fact, this whole thing started when um, I wound up making a mistake in a search and finally finding a, a hit on some real significant information about Modesta Avila, contemporary with her release from prison. Um, so in it, to anticipate one of the things that we're going to uh, look at and correct, would you um, mind? No, I did not die in prison. So we, we have some nice records to look at on that. So let's continue. If my clicker will work. There we go. Um, it is, this, this lecture is based on my, my um, essay, uh, Modesta. Again, I, I believe I understood Chris to say, or Stephanie to say, that there are some copies that might be distributed at the end, or be able, you, you would be able to access them. Uh, that would be to my article. And then the other one would be Elizabeth Haas, Conquests and Historical Identities in California. Uh, our work overlaps quite a bit. Um, and uh, I, I highly recommend that to understand this process as well. Okay. Um, so 
what we're going to do today is, or tonight, um, who was Modesta Avila and why she, is she important to California history? Um, one thing you should note is she was a cause celeb in her day, 1889. There were over 20 newspaper articles that focused on her alone. That doesn't count uh, the articles that were written about her attorney, the judge, and so on and so forth. Um, there are mus multiple historical essays. Um, there's some dramatic work, plays, and so forth that have been done on her. So, um, <clears throat> but today she's basically um, a metaphor for uh, several different causes and themes. Um, and so again, the record should be correct if she is being used as a metaphor for those things. So, and that's why it's important to correct the record. And so, and obviously we're gonna tell you what the corrected record says. So in simple form, for those of you who have never had any contact with this story, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you the high points of what is reasonably accurate in her story. Then what we, we're going to do is we're going to go through the claims for who she was and what she did versus the reality of who she was and what she did. Uh, so starting off with Modesta as a 22-year-old young lady, um, she was daughter of a Californio, which will be, um, that term will come up quite a bit through this lecture. Um, he owned 14 acres in San Juan Capistrano, just north of the mission, approximately where that little house was, a uh, fictional house in the painting. She blocked the tracks. Um, and when you block the tracks in California, it, even in, even in uh, that early time, there was something on the books called Penal Code 587.1, which said you can't do that. Uh, you, and you can't do it with malice, which means you can't do it with the intent to um, uh, stop or harm a train. <clears throat> She got three years for it. She got, uh, she got plenty of time and became the first convicted felon in Orange County history. Uh, and the county was formed March 11th, 1889. She did her crime in June of 1889, uh, but wasn't prosecuted until uh, roughly October. So um, there are other facts. Um, many are disputed or false or uh, exaggerated. And again, we'll try to correct those. Um, <clears throat> you can't understand her story. Let me back up here a second. Okay, there we go. Uh, we can't understand her story without understanding the, what was going on in the background. Her story is tied to her father and her father's um, growing up time and the, the times that they both, that both of them grew up, or the Pamela family grew up in. Two systems from Spain heavily determined rank and status and identity in, in, in California society. One was Costa. And uh, if I were in a live classroom, I'd, raise, I'd have everybody raise their hand that knows what Costa is. Um, so I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But basically, Costa was uh, a system that determined the relative rank by the relative purity of your blood. Limpieza uh, de sangre. Uh, basically, it's a racial classification. It began early, early, early in Spain to distinguish um, Catholic converted Moors and Jewish converted uh, Catholics uh, and to distinguish them from Spaniards who were Catholic and who were natural to the land. So it was a racial uh, uh, system from the beginning. Um, it came into very strong prominence when uh, Spain started to colonize uh, the, the New World because they wanted their people, quote unquote, to be at the highest rank. And everyone who was mixed or was from other, some other race was going to be down the list. And that, that, that pertained to your, your rights to go into different jobs and um, your upward mobility and all kinds of things. So it was important to have as high a rank as you could in the Costa system. A corollary of Costa is gente de razón, which means person of reason. And essentially that translates to uh, someone who speaks Spanish, is Catholic, and um, isn't of a um, undesirable class. <clears throat> and I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, cast, the, the people in the higher classes and the people even in the mixed classes were as presumed to have gente de razón um, as long as they were Hispanicized. If you were Indian, pure Indian, and hadn't gone through any his, Hispanicization, no such word, but let's, you understand what I mean, um, 
then um, they were sin rason, which means they did not have reason. It was a way of distinguishing one person from another in, in class. And then the, the, the other system wasn't a racial system, it was a moral system, and it's called siete partidas. And that determined the legitimacy and honor of the person at birth. So think baptism, think mission records, think neighbors who know that you, you, you um, were a, the bastard son of such and such and such and such. So that's essentially what that's about. Um, okay, I'm clicking, but there we go. So um, on the left, it's just a visual picture of, of uh, las siete partidas, and then on the right is basically um, a um, a graph of of the various classes that could be uh, 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 parsed. Uh, but there are much more than this. Actually, the, the, normally you see sixteen, uh, but you get the gist. Basically, Spaniards are going to be at the top, at, uh, the the ones that are born on the Iberian Peninsula. And next are going to be the people, the Spaniards who are born uh, offshore in the colonies and so forth. And then we have mestizos who are usually mixed with the uh, indigenous and mulattoes who are uh, mixed with the um, uh, blacks and so forth. Uh, but 16 is the normal. <clears throat> um, and they go, and, and in some cases, they went far beyond that. Because if you look at the permutations of one person mixed with another person, mixing with another person who's mixed with another person and so on and so forth it gets kind of crazy and that's why the system actually wound up uh, being too burdensome to keep up with but it was still in effect and frankly many scholars argue that it's still in effect even though it's been officially abolished since 1821. okay um so in the spanish costa system as i've said you're ranked by the purity of your blood. Persons of pure Spanish blood were at the highest rank. They were presumed to have gente de razón, um, and it that attribute was was assumed. Uh, with mixed blood, they were as they would also be assumed to have gente de razón um, as long as they were Hispanicized. <clears throat> um, but Indians uh, would not have it that 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 quality. It, that becomes important because. Uh, Gente de razón becomes a category unto itself as casta starts to die. Um, okay. Um, because Alta California was so distant from the cultural centers, basically they started to take on um, their own rules. <clears throat> In addition to the complicated permutations that you could get out of all the mixture, possible mixtures you could, you could come up with, um, in addition to that, um, people weren't really following it. What they were doing is they were cheating and basically they were asked, what is your, where are you in the caste system? They said, well, I'm a Spaniard, even though they were mixed with Indian blood or whatever. Um, so, uh, so that minor rebellion or assertion that I'm, I am Spanish, so therefore I, I belong in this upper caste, well, uh, took predominance because there was no one there to enforce it other than the priests who were getting overwhelmed with the number of permutations that I, that I mentioned. <clears throat> um, the Padres recorded not only Casta, they also recorded the, the le legitimacy of, of the um, child at birth. So mission birth records for Carmen Avila, that is Modesta's father, his full name was um, um, Jose del Carmen uh, Avila. <clears throat> He was born, he was called Espurio. Espurio means spurious, and essentially it has a specific name under the uh, Siete Partidas. It means you were born to an unmarried, promiscuous mother who was unsure of who the father was. The whole, whole reason the Siete Partidas was in existence was to assure the patrimony uh, and guarantee the patrimony of the child through the father. Um, so, um, um, uh, that's it on that point. Okay, Carmen's, Carmen Avila's mission record, as I said, was Hispurio, and here it is. This is actually a transliteration of the actual mission record. His le legitimacy is Hispurio, which is the worst kind of illegitimacy you can have. There are several classes of it. Um, and her, his mother, 
who was named Josefa de Indio, Josefa Indio, meaning Josefa, who is an Indian, was single. She had several children, and every birth record she had, she was single. And so the priests basically um, were, were, were declaring those children as uh, illegitimate, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but when it comes to espurio, the more accurate word would be in our language, bastard. So think of it in that way. Um, so context. Um, so as I said, um, the Casticism was being rebelled against by the people who were far away from cultural centers and basically saying, no, I'm Spaniard. So, and they, they were getting away with it. But by the 13, uh, early 1800s, because this, the Casta system was starting to basically be ignored, Gente de Razón became very important. It distinguished themselves from Indios. Uh, they also identified as the next uh, uh, identity was hijos de, del país, which means children of the land. And the other term was California. In the original California definition, it was basically people who lived in Alta California. Later, it came to be uh, associated with people who were landed, uh, with, had cattle and so forth, were getting land grants and so on and so forth. And that would be the Zorro uh, kind of mode uh, you might be familiar with. One thing stayed the same. No one wanted to be in the Indio class, at least not at the time. So as the illegitimate son of Martin Avila, he was raised by an unwed Indian mother. Um, she, Modesta's father, uh, probably identified as, uh, as an Indian. <clears throat> he was perceived as one, and he was listed as one in the 1850 census. At 10 years of age, though, he competitioned with his cousin for, uh, in law for a land grant from Mexico for land just north of the mission. Go back to that picture and imagine that little house there. <clears throat> that is approximately where uh, the land resided. However, it was much larger than the parcel he actually wound up with. And we don't know why he wound up with only 14 acres or how he even got the 14 acres. But he did petition Mexico for a land grant uh, in 1843. Um, <clears throat> his mother dies in 1850, and he's inferred to be living. And when I say inferred, it, it was a, a very important genealogist who inferred that he was there. He is not named as there, but um, all of Ho jo Josefa's children at, at the right ages, including someone named Antonio uh, de Los Angeles, Los, uh, Los Angeles. Pardon my Spanish for you Spanish speakers. I try. <laughs> Okay, um, they uh, basically uh, took these orphans in and Julian Chavez uh, was the uh, head of household. Um, and um, the other thing to keep in mind is that De Los, De Los Angeles was a common name for Indians uh, at the time. <clears throat> in the census uh, of 1850, um, um, Carmen Avila is uh, Carmen Avila, or, or uh, basically Antonio de Los Angeles, uh, is marked as I for Indio, and that's the U.S. Census, by the way, because they, the California had become a, a U.S. state uh, by that by that time. Okay, so context again: identity in Spanish California continued. Um, it's unclear if that co-petition for the land ever got through, but there's an 1875 map, which we're going to look at in a minute, that shows him as the owner of a small 14-acre portion, uh, and this was the land that Modesta claimed belonged to her. And when she said it belonged to her, you can, in, you can, you can interpret that as she was literal, that she thought it belonged to her, or you can interpret it as it belonged to the family. It did belong to the family, but unfortunately, it didn't belong to the family when she blocked the tracks. Okay, now in the 18th century, um, as I said, California was, uh, at the beginning, uh, was casually linked to any Hispanic inhabitants in California. By the 1850s, during the cattle period in the gold rush, California began, began to take on a different meeting and it was a new class identifier, which basically meant owners of land, especially land grantees or rancheros. Okay, so as the illegitimate son of Martin Avila, raised by an unwed mother, Modesta's father likely identified as Indio, was perceived as un. We already did that, didn't we? 
we're going to go down here. Okay, so this is kind of a summary of the identity migration for, for inhabitants of California. So over here on the left-hand side, we have Spaniards. They would be at the top, and I don't distinguish between Peninsulares or the Corillos that were, that were Spaniards who were born to Spanish uh, 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 parents. Then there was mixed blood inhabitants with hint, who had the attribute of gente de razón, and there were Indians who were sin de razón. In other words, they were the opposite. All that was defined by Costa in the beginning. Then we go to a phase where persons with gente de razón or persons identifying as hijos de pais or Californios, uh, th that was Costa influence, but Indios were still at the bottom of the rung. And then finally, in the last phase, there's, there's one difference which comes in, which is the landed Californios took on a higher status than almost anyone else. Okay, eight. now we're gonna, here's the other piece of the context. And we're gonna get to Modesta story in just a second. So uh, California statehood in 1850, um, <clears throat> if you were Indio, you were subjected to additional um, dangers. And I'm just gonna give a quote from the then governor. That, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, at, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. In other words, um, he wasn't assigning a lot of worth to being an Indian in California. That also prompted several municipalities to put bounties on the heads of Indians. So that was the environment that Carmen uh, was uh, born into. And he went, at the time of that speech, he was 18. Now, with that context in mind, that context is going to help us explain why people did what they did in the Avila family uh, uh, in 1889. So who was she? Well, we went through this, and this is essentially the story, but we need to go further. Why is it important? It's because her tale has become a metaphor metaphorical vehicle for scholars and the public to, to illustrate important themes. Uh, your corrected version is going to lead to a broader picture uh, of post-conquest life among Hispanic and indigenous populations in Alta California and a demonstration of the importance of identifying as California versus identifying as a Californian. So here's the romantic view. This is the story that most of us have heard and the story that I heard before I started doing my research. Um, the fam Avila family owned a small plot of land near the mission where uh, Modesta raised, chick raised chickens. Her, now, her house is now the Hummingbird Cafe. And again, I'd go for a call of hands to see how many people heard that story. Um, the California Central, which was a subsidiary of the Santa Fe Railroad, laid tracks across their land in 1888 when they started running trains, they disturbed her chickens. In protest in 1889, she blocked the trains from crossing her land by stringing her laundry across the tracks and leaving a note that says, this land belongs to me. And if the railroad wants to run here, they will have to pay me $10,000. That is an accurate quote. She said, she said that twice in two different ways, but essentially meant the same thing. And that comes from the trial transcript, uh, her criminal trial transcript. Of what I just said right here, um, there's, there's only three things that are, that are really accurate. Um, one of them is they own a small plot of land. The railroad did um, lay tracks in 1888, uh, and the quotation was correct. The stringing of laundry was patently not correct. Um, the other thing is claimed is she was negotiating for compensation with a man named Mendelssohn, the railroad agent. And where I get this from, by the way, is from several different sources. So you, you can read summaries of Modesta's Avila story in, in many different places. So I'm, I'm picking from all these sources. Um, some said her act was just a symbolic protest, not a serious attempt to block a train. <clears throat> um, she was arrested, tried, and convicted by a biased all-white jury on a rumor of immorality rather than the facts. She died in prison two days later of pneumonia or tuberculosis and possibly was pregnant. And the last we see of her is in a prison photo with her identity stripped from her as she wears the prison uniform. 
Um, it's widely used in scholarship to show a simple story of great pathos. Um, and um, I was hooked into the pathos. I think most of you were that, that have heard the story before. Um, and, you know, it does pull you in. It, it, it pulls you to your heartstrings. She's 22 years old. She goes to prison. She dies there for what? Putting laundry across, laundry, stringing laundry across the tracks. Uh, but <clears throat> it's used um, to show ethnic and gender discrimination, injustice, disparate treatments by the court, a girl speaking truth to power, the decline of the Californios, railroad intransigence like the Muscle Slough story, if you're familiar with that one, and Anglo intolerance and prejudice towards Mexicans and Indians. The real story is who owned the land. Popular version is Modesta owned the land um, and um, the, Santa, the Santa Fe or the California Central trespassed across it. The correct version is neither Modesta nor her parents, Carmen and Juliana uh, Avila owned the land they lived on at the time of the incident. They did own the land in 1875, they didn't own the land at the time of the incident. And we'll go into more detail on that. <clears throat> Who owned the land? <coughs> Pardon me, I'm going to take a sip of water. And chew some ice. The 1875 map shows Carmen Avila owned the land in 1875. It lies a quarter mile north of the crossing, which those of you familiar with uh, San Juan Capistrano will know it as Verdugo Road. It's where the theaters are, and it's where you walk across the tracks to go into the um, old town. Um, but there's an 1886 map, um, which was a tax uh, assessment map, um, showing the same land in possession of Marco Forster, who bought it in 1886. Um, <clears throat> two years after the 1886 to Forster, a subsidi the, the, this subsidiary, the California Central, um, crossed the land uh, with his putative permission in 1888. But there's a grant deed showing the sale of the land from Carmen Avila to Marco Forster, notarized by the Justice of the Peace, Judge Richard Egan in 1886. And again, I would ask to have a ha hands raised for how many of you are familiar with Judge Richard Egan? A very prominent, very interesting, very uh, charismatic man um, that, um, that needs more of the treatment that, uh, that that, that uh, Modesta is getting now. And so it's one of my future projects and uh, interesting, interesting man. Anyway, <clears throat> who owned the land? The family continued to live on the land as if it were their own and they kept up the appearance of land ownership. Why would they do that? Um, three years after the sale in June of 1889, Modesta blocked the tracks demanding $10,000 for right of way across her land. Does anyone think that's a high price for, uh, for the land? Um, it certainly seems like it would be. It was going for between $100 and $400 an acre um, at the time. There was a rapid uh, rise in land prices, but it, 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 at least $100 an acre. Um, and this was $10,000 for a right of way across this strip of land. Okay, during the trial, neither Modesta, if she knew, her father, who did know because he signed the deed, nor Egan, who was the... Um, notary, nor Fost Forster, who was the buyer, alerted the court to the fact that Modesta did not own the land. There's a big red flag from that fact alone as to something strange is going on with this land transaction. Um, and that is the heart of our story, frankly. So here's the map. If you look up here um, in the upper third, and if you can see now Ahashimen Ahash Road, I don't speak Ahashimen either, so Sorry, uh, it used to be called San Fernando Road. It was changed to Ahashimin uh, during the latter part of uh, um, uh, the 20th century. And if you notice, it's right in the center uh, at the top, Carmon, C-R-M-O-N. By the way, misspell misspellings of names are very common in, in maps and genealogy. And it says 14.3 acres belonging to Carmen Avila. The mission is in the lower right for orientation purposes. And if you look at the painting or, or visualize yourself in the painting, basically at the bottom looking, uh, looking towards the top, towards the word Forster that I have up there, Marco Forster, <clears throat> that's the orientation. Okay, now here's the 1886 map and you'll see M.A. Forster owning the 14.32. 
um, acres that was um, that belonged to um, uh, Jose del Carmen Avila. And the mission, you can see it over here in the far right, <clears throat> in the middle, middle far right. Okay, so between, let's go back again, look at it again. Here it is. Uh, it's a little bit different in scale, but it, it basically borders San Fernando Road. By the way, that is one of the one of the uh, markers for the for the uh, land grant claim. So, in other words, this is the same property. It isn't the extent of the property, but it is part of that same parcel that he he applied for a land grant for. And down here, here we go. Marco Forster got that land. And here we are to orient. Um, and again, I said that there were two houses on the Avila property. Um, this White House would actually have been a little bit, would have been much further over to the right, uh, maybe a, approximately where the top of the uh, steeple is. <clears throat> and the other house where, um, where Modesta lived with her sister was to the left and over by the tracks. And here we have another view. The, the mission is directly to your right. And this is the current road uh, that goes north. And Modesta's house that she lived in with her sister would have been, if you can see the second car on the road, approximately that location, which is where um, San Fernando Road or Aja, Aja Shemin Road is now. So the house is approximately right there. So the, I mentioned the two, two houses <clears throat> um, and testimony said that, that um, uh, basically located the house one eighth to one quarter mile north of Verdugo Road. I would estimate from the pictures and where Verdugo Road is that it's a, about a quarter of a mile. Here is the deed that I found in a cellar in, um, in Carson. And if you notice on the right, the box is, says Carmen Abila. He's using a B instead of a V. And Juliana Abila, husband and wife. <clears throat> and Richard Egan, you can see just to the left of that, who is the notary. Um, and you can see the date, uh, 29th day of October. And if you can do, it was written out longhand, 1886. Then Richard Egan, notary of public, and so on and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> so this deed essentially says, Carmen and Juliana and the buyer and Richard Egan all know the property has been sold. This is two years, um, two years, 1886, it's three years before um, Modesta blocks the tracks. So why did Modesta block the tracks on land she did not own? The question comes up, was she unaware of the sale as were all of the neighbors? The Avalas lived on the land as if it were their own. Why were they doing that? Did she assume because of that, that it was theirs? Um, and as I pointed out, neither Egan, Forster, nor Modesta's parents told the criminal court during the trial that the land did not belong to Modesta or her family. They kept it secret. Why didn't they tell? Egan was a justice of the peace. He was duty bound to, to tell the court. He had an ethical duty to tell the court. Marco Forster was a major landowner. Um, there's still a high, or junior high school named after him. Marco Forster, Forster is huge in San, San Juan Capistrano history. Prominent people, they did not tell the truth. They, did, they, they hid a truth from the court. Something big was going on. <clears throat> Land ownership was key to Carmen Avila's claim to be a Californio and escape his Indio past. As I said, a Californio with a land grant basically hopscotched into a high position. Um, with his Avila name, he was on his way to escaping his Indio past and Indio identity. Uh, but under, the, under Costa, what he was leaving, he was um, the bastard son of Martin Avila, raised by an Indio woman. And because he was India, he was the lowest in the caste system. Lifted ownership of the land, lifted him out and rehabilitated him, him as an Avila with the help of the family. And my assertion is, my thesis is that the rigid secrecy surrounding the sale of the land by the three parties who knew of it, given their, given their prominence in the, in the community and their unwillingness to tell the court 
of what was this truth. Uh, it was testimony to Carmen's intense desire to avoid losing his California identity and his status in his community. Um, I have some other corrections to the record. This happens to be the Hummingbird House Cafe. And um, many have claimed that this is her house. Unfortunately, it's a quarter of a mile away from the house. Um, uh, trial testimony placed the house uh, one eighth to one quarter mile north of the crossing, which is Verdugo Road. And the Hummingbird House actually sits on Verdugo Road. So it's basically a quarter mile away from it. It looks like it could be, the tracks are very close but it's not. <clears throat> Modesta's act was merely a symbolic protest. She was kind of like an innocent 22 year old girl. She really didn't mean to hurt the train. Um, and she strung long laundry, strung her laundry over the tracks. Uh, the factual version for the trial transcript, she laid a, a, a railroad tie or two and a steel bar across the tracks sufficient to derail it. The transcript also suggests she had done this several times. She also did it just before the express train was supposed to come through. So you can infer from that that Modesta might not have been that nice, unfortunately, or she was pretty angry, but um, she was serious. This wasn't symbolic. Um, okay, time out, I'm gonna have to make a little adjustment here. Okay, there we go. Okay, the evidence, <clears throat> that she was serious is she met, this is all for the trial transcript. She met with WK James of the Commercial Bank in Santa Ana. She told him that she was expecting a wire transfer of $10,000 from San Bernardino, headquarters of the California Central at the time, by the way. James indicated that she said the railroad had come to terms with her after she placed a post across the tracks. She was negotiating with someone. Um, at the time, she was negotiating with the right-of-way agent. The right-of-way agent happened to be Judge Richard Egan. Judge Richard Egan had taken the job of a right-of-way agent from the Santa Fe Railroad. By the way, he became a stockholder and a major, major uh, one on the board of the Santa Fe Railroad. I'm not insinuating uh, anything evil here with Judge Richard Egan. I am saying he worked for the railroad, and his job was to negotiate with Modesta. I think his hands were tied. My theory is his hands were tied. Um, he was bound by contract uh, along with um, Marco Forster uh, in, the, in the transfer deed, that there was a subcontract that forbid them from, from saying anything about the land sale. That's my theory. I don't have any proof of that. I'm just looking at the surrounding facts. And why would Judge Richard Egan risk his reputation um, by not telling the court the truth about the land sale? So um, the popular version says that she was talking with Mendelssohn, but he was a Wells Fargo agent. He had nothing to do with the railroad, frankly. <clears throat> so the blockage of the track was intended to coerce payment. And according to W.K. James, as I said, he said that she said the railroad had come to terms with her after she placed the post on the tracks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... Now I'm looking at the negotiation and I have to ask myself, why, was, why didn't Richard Egan head this off by telling Modesta he couldn't negotiate the price for the land because she didn't own it or her family didn't own it? Why did he string her along thinking uh, that she would be paid the $10,000? Um, was there, and this is my question and this is my theory, was there a subagreement that, that tied into the sale that bound Egan and Forster from, uh, from uh, revealing that Carmen Avila was no longer a landed Californian. Okay, here's the second piece. Um, Modesta was reputed to have died in prison of pneumonia or tuberculosis and probably pregnant. Truth, she was released from prison on good behavior on March 3rd, 1892. And we'll show you how that was calculated for her early release. There was no record of child or pregnancy in the prison record. The proof is there's a photo stamped discharged. Um, it also shows the date of her discharge from prison. Um, there's also the prison record itself, which says, which agrees with the photo stamp that she was discharged on March, March 3rd. There's also a San Francisco newspaper article describing her release 
um, as uh, March 3rd. And then there's an announcement of her marriage in San Francisco soon after her release to a co-prisoner in April of 1892. Okay, so this is the ubiquitous photo that everyone sees and I'm tired of looking at, frankly. I wish there were more pictures. Um, variety is the spice of life. And I think Modesta is, you know, she has piercing eyes. She has she a striking photograph um, and all of that. But I really wish there was another photo of her so that we wouldn't get, frankly, fatigued by looking at the same photo. Well, here's a different version of it. Notice that the, all, the photo you usually see is cropped. It doesn't show discharged 3392. Um, that's the prison intake photo, and this is the photo that is basically on record at, at San Quentin. Here is the prison record, <clears throat> and it basically shows her prisoner number. It shows that, um, okay, it's taken out on a writ, writ of habeas corpus. She, she was pulled out of um, uh, prison to appear for um, a hearing her lawyer had um, uh, petitioned for but it was denied the same day. So she went right back on the same day. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but it, note that it says that she was discharged Mar th March 3rd, 1892 in agreement with the photo. Now, this is another piece that tells us um, that this is all accurate. Okay, she was sentenced for three years. That should have meant that she was, would have gotten out uh, three months later than March 3rd, 1892. But if you look at the quasi-transparent yellow highlight below, in the third year of a three-year sentence, she should have been released in two years and four months, and it's to the day that she's released on that day. There's no record here. You just look at it and go, okay, well, when, when should M Modesta have been released? Well, this is California law. This is when she should have been released if she had good behavior, and she was. So the article in the San Francisco call was too long for me to put here. It's a really interesting article, and you, you'll be able to see the whole thing in, um, in the paper. Um, uh, but the, 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 there's, the newspaper man basically uh, was on the Sausalito Pier, and he jotted down handwritten notes and he spoke with a with a, a lady called Modesta Belau. She had arrived from the ten thir on the ten thirty ferry from San Quentin to Sausalito. Um, the call article appeared on March fifth of eighteen ninety two. They wrote it, they put it, and then they had to print it. Uh, this release of Molest Modesta Belau. Um, I'm not too concerned about the misspelling. Sometimes her name is spelled Bella, uh, Abela, Avila, uh, and, and we'll show you another spelling of it in the marriage announcement in just a second. But uh, this particular person was released on March 3rd and the article appeared two days after that. <clears throat> and he, um, the, the newspaper man described her as a comely woman who had laid an obstruction on the tracks. And then he said the Southern Pacific Railroad in I think, believe Santa Barbara County, but that's okay. I mean, you have to visualize somebody on the tracks taking notes, um, people walking by and so on and so forth. I'm, I, I, I don't know how this many facts could line up and Modesta Belau not be Modesta Avila. Okay, <clears throat> the same article stated that prison warders were concerned that, that um, some ex-prisoners were waiting for her in the dock. And I say that that's probably true because she married one of them, um, as we'll see in a second. Here it is. Uh, and this is thanks, this is courtesy of Chris Jenshin and I don't know if Chris is in the audience but Chris, uh, thank you very much. This was very helpful. Um, and uh, basically, um, Frank Edwards and uh, Modesta Abila, um, um, Al, he, he, they spell it Albila, sorry. Uh, so there's another variant on her spelling. Uh, so she was married in April of 1892, a month after she left prison. I frankly can tell you, I haven't been able to find anything after that whether she went into, uh, you know, was pressed into, uh, um, um, uh, you know, a house of ill recruit, which was what the prison was concerned with, or whether they lived happily ever after, I have no idea. But there's, there's no record that I've been able to find of, 
what happened to her afterwards, even uh, a, a birth or, I'm sorry, a death record. We, we do not know yet. A challenge for, for one of you. Okay, there's another claim that there's pathos in her picture. One person psycho, psychoanalyzed it uh, 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 in great detail. And um, we can look at the picture and say she looks helpless, helpless and pitiful. And she, but the other part of it is that she's there humiliated in a prison uniform. Um, but not she, that might be because not because she is wearing um, prison garb. This is what she wore from San Juan Capistrano. So that's interesting. That's period dress. How do we know that? Well, look at the lady over here on the right. The protocol for taking the intake photos for women was one photo and it was three for the men. The men basically got uh, what they came in with, which is, I guess, typically a hat. And then the next one, they took the hat off. Uh, and the third one, they basically shaved them, put them in prison uh, garb, and, and then put the details on a chalkboard behind their head. Women come in, like the men in the first photograph, wearing civilian clothes. Um, certainly not a crocheted uh, uh, prison uniform of the lady on the right. Modesta is frankly um, wearing what she arrived at prison in as well. So excuse me. So, um, so this was just what I just said. Okay, the next piece was that she was convicted on her morals uh, or her lack of morals, I should say. <clears throat> um, that was partly deduced from the fact that the first jury deadlocked 6-6. Six, six. Well, in the first place, the jury deadlock was 5-7. It's a minor matter, but <clears throat> the second jury convicted. Why would one jury deadlock 6-6 six, six or 5-7 and the second jury convict? Well, the explanation was, was uh, built that um, uh, it was only after rumors and reports of her immorality in the news that circulated between the trials did jury number two convict. Um, the rumor, unfortunately, was claimed by her incompetent attorney, but he, he did it on appeal in chambers. The, the, the jury never heard this part. So it, it's, it's basically part of the appellate record. Um, <clears throat> so it happened even after the trial. Jurors never heard it. Um, the few, there were a few newspapers. The Sacramento, Sacramento Union uh, basically was pretty hard on her. And uh, they said one of, their, one of their pieces was good for the morals, uh, but they were hundreds of miles away. And, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't the, peop the paper that people were reading in Santa Ana. So, um, so the local press, on the other hand, was very even handed. I didn't find one piece locally here. Uh, that would be the Riverside D, um, Los Angeles Herald and so forth. Uh, none of them basically uh, went overboard with, uh, with, a, with opinion on her, her moral character or anything like that. The jurors never heard this part. Uh, now, Dan Baker is an interesting guy. Um, Dan Baker uh, of, of the Santa Ana Standard, basically, he report he's the he is the sole source of the rumor that she died in prison. He created the rumor. <clears throat> there is no other source for this information. And he wrote, Modesta, a well-known favorite of the Santa Ana boys, died in the penitentiary this week at San Quentin. She had served two years of her time was was getting along finally when she was stricken down in the prime of her usefulness. Those who are without sin throw the first stone. Well, that's pretty cruel, especially since it was false. I mean, we've seen the prison record. We, we know that she was released. Why, why would someone do this? I, I don't know. But there's a, there's a little fact here that's interesting. Um, since it had, no, it had no effect on the jury because it was published 19 months after the trial. So that number one has no effect. But this, you see this quote over and over again uh, as as proof that she died, except it wasn't reported until 19 months after she was, um, after the trial itself. Okay, um, per Jim Sleeper, Dan Baker was a fellow Hoosier, fellow attorney, fellow part politician, fellow booster of the Orange County Los Angeles split, and a fellow booster of the railroad along with E.E. E. Edwards, the prosecuting attorney or the DA. 
Now, why Baker chose to write this false obituary, um, I don't know. His connection to E.E. E. Edwards, I, I don't even see a logic of doing that, especially if the information is, is just bogus and false. No other newspaper uh, reported her death in prison. He is the, no one even noted Dan Baker's uh, obit and said, Dan Baker said, or anything like that. Nothing was completely silent. Okay, so what new discoveries have we made? Um, <clears throat> um, Modesta was a poor but direct descendant of neighboring Avalis, really important Avalis. So uh, what we now know as Laguna Beach, Dana Point, South of San Clemente, Laguna Niguel, Aliso Viejo, and Aliso Beach, uh, I'm sorry, Avila Beach in Northern California, all belong to direct uh, relatives of Modesta Avila. Um, but her father didn't identify with those Avalas for most of his early life due to his Indio identity and illegitimate birth. That's why we spent so much time on the context. Um, Okay, we, we know he was an Ill, he was illegitimate. He was a spurio. He was also one half Tongva. Okay, for those of you who are familiar the, with the tribes, forgive me. We'll we'll talk a little bit about this. But the but the Ahajimen were basically um, in the south of the Los Angeles area, um, and the Tongva were basically going east west uh, out to uh, say Car uh, Camarillo and all through the Los Angeles and San Diego, uh, I'm sorry, San Gabriel area and into the San Gabriel mountains. Okay, um, <clears throat> so our Carmen was half Tongva raised by an Indian mother uh, who was Tongva, not by Avalos. Um, through her father, Modesta is possibly related to Toy Purina. Again, a raise of hands, how many are familiar with the Toy Purina story? Um, she was part of the Serrano group of Tongas. Um, she was a shaman woman, and she basically stirred up a lot of mischief uh, and organized uh, several tribes to attack the Spanish missionaries. Unfortunately, it was headed off, <clears throat> and um, after everything settled down, she wound up being basically uh, ported off to Northern California. Uh, but um, her story is, is really interesting because it was one of the few uh, rebellions uh, of the Indian tribes against the missionary system. <clears throat> PBS has a whole um, series on her, and it's called The People of the Pines, if you care to see it. It's very good. Um, <clears throat> Josefa, that would be Car Carmel's mother, uh, was the daughter of, I can't pronounce this word, um, Okay, it's on the screen. You can read it for yourself. Okay. Uh, and um, um, a Tumia bomb of the Serrano tribe, the same tribe that, to that Toy Purina came from. Uh, Toy Purina herself came from the Japchipit Rancheria uh, village in the San Gabriel Range above Pasadena. That village was closely linked to all the other uh, villages, including the word I couldn't say where Modesta's paternal grandmother uh, came from and the Tusikabit village where her paternal grandfather came from. So our Carmel Avila <clears throat> is one half related to a uh, tribe uh, and, and, and discrete groups of that tribe that basically spawned the Toy, Toy Purina story. There's more to this and there's much more research that needs to be done here. Um, so what does this tin query tell us about Modesta and her era? Better to be anything than an Indian. And being coming California was, was uh, Carmel's ticket. Uh, land ownership and California identity, identity were almost synonymous by 1850, um, which is going to lead us to our conclusion about why uh, Carmel was so insistent on the secrecy of the sale of the land. Um, Egan and Marco Forster played a much larger role in the Modesta affair, and there are many questions about their conduct that still need to be answered. Um, and also, there were others who blocked the railroad in separate incidents contemporary with Modesta who were not prosecuted. Um, and that's interesting enough. Um, here's some disparate facts just to throw in here. Um, there's evidence of financial distress that forced the sale of the land. Um, but again, tragically, without the land, he was no longer a Californian. His wife, Juliana, died soon after the sale. 
Carmen Avila, uh, when he became a landless farmer, he disappears. There's no record of him anywhere. Uh, Juliana is buried in the Mission Cemetery, um, but Carmen, Carmen Avila is not there. He just basically disappears. Mm -hmm. he, he, he appeared in almost every voting register uh, from the time that he arrived in San Juan Capistrano. He literally disappears. It's not heard from again. Okay, Modesto wasn't the only blocker of, of the railroad for perceived, perceived trespass. Here were the close contemporaries. James Irvine of Rancho San Joaquin, uh, which he purchased from Sepulveda. Colonel Griffith of the Griffith Park and Griffith Observatory and Greek Theater fame. Here are their stories. <clears throat> number, number one, this, this story is, is fairly well detailed, um, but um, Basically, the head of the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, and James Irvine uh, knew each other from a long time ago. And um, the head of uh, the Southern Pacific basically cheated at cards and Irvine, he, Irvine hated the man. Anyway, um, there was a court order denying um, um, uh, right of way for the Southern Pacific to go across the Rancho San Joaquin. And, uh, but on a weekend, uh, when everyone was supposed to be sleeping and not being paying attention, they started laying track across the land. So Irvine got wind of it and sent out his armed uh, cowboys and basically stopped them in their tracks, literally. <clears throat> so that was one. And, and note, note, the, note the position. This is 1888. Um, Modesta does her bad act in 1889. I don't know that there's a direct relationship here and the acts aren't actually identical in, in their nature, legally speaking. Uh, but nevertheless, this, this happened uh, and was widely reported uh, in the papers. <clears throat> Griffith, Colonel Griffith, I should say, um, this is a quote from the, from the Los Angeles Herald. The men engaged in the trespass were rounded up and herded out onto San Pedro Street by those who engaged uh, by those engaged in guarding Colonel Griffith's premises. And they were warned in no uncertain way that an attempt to enter upon the property would be undertaken at their peril. Okay. Now, what he says is interesting. There's a kind of a poetic echo here. The facts are these. I own the land, the railroad wishes to cross it. And if you want that piece of land and come to me to buy it, I will set my price on it. You cannot take my land until you pay my price. Compared to Modesta, this land belongs to me. And if you want it, you got to pay me. Okay, to paraphrase. Okay, um, but facts are facts. Modesta was a young girl. Um, she had no power, had little power. Um, and she did stand up. She did stand up. She did. There's no question that she stood up. She was defiant. She was absolutely determined to get that $10,000. Why she thought she could get $10,000, I have no idea, but she was determined. Okay, so Avila blocked the tracks with an obstacle, believing that the railroad was trespassing on her land, thus violating California statute. Um, it wasn't her land, but neither she nor the court knew that, right? So Irvine, on the other hand, blocked the lane of tracks in the belief that the railroad was trespassing. It's a little different. Um, and really wouldn't come under the same law. Uh, Griffin also blocked the laying of the tracks. But I mean, I'm not expecting Modesta to have a lawyer's approach to whether or not her act was the same as, um, as Irvine's act. Um, basically, she looked at it as a trespass and her method of blocking the trespass. That's how I look at it. And that's probably how she looked at it from a lay standpoint. Okay. So what's important about these new facts? Um, it underscores the importance of the land as key to California identity. And it, 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 it shows why the land sale was secret. It allowed Carmen to continue the lie that he was a Californio, even after he sold it. And they continued to, 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 uh, live upon the land just as if they still owned it. No one in Capistrano piped up. No one knew. It explains why Modesta probably was unaware that, that her father no longer owned the land. And between the lines, the outrageous price she demanded uh, appears to be punitive. Uh, feels like that to me and some others. 
um, <clears throat> and possibly to, to punish and recompense uh, for the social and physical disruption of the California lives by the inexorable arrival of the ambitious Europeans as symbolized by the railroad. I know if I were in their shoes, I would not have been happy to see that um, come across the land and basically change their entire life in a matter of a decade. Um, Modesta was treated differently than Irvine or Griffith, but you know, I mean, that, that still happens. Um, um, while subtle differences occur, uh, that was referring to the Irvine and um, Colonel Griffith. Um, <clears throat> she, was, she was basically acting in good faith to protect the land. Um, and I believe, that the, I believe that the trial transcript shows that when she, when she speaks to people and they, they, they basically tell the court what she said to them, she was earnest in the idea that it's my land. Of course I can do this. They can't come across my land. And so um, there's an earnestness in her words, in the words uh, as, uh, as they were described by the people she spoke with. Now, here are some unanswered questions that really go to, um, is, was there a big brother move here? Um, and I can't, I can't say, but there are some anomalies in, in the record that just don't make sense. Why was she arrested in Santa Ana? by Santa Ana authorities instead of Justice of the Peace, Richard Egan and San Juan Capistrano. Well, we can, we can guess that, that he didn't want to mix up his um, right of way uh, agent role with his Justice of the Peace role. But I mean, Richard Egan had a reputation for being you know, a Renaissance man. He could do all this stuff. He didn't do it. Had he done it, he, it probably would have been a more measured response because um, no one, at the third point here, no one in San Juan Capistrano seemed to think it was a very big deal. Everyone went on about their business. She did this in June. She wasn't prosecuted until October and not in San Juan Capistrano. She was prosecuted in Santa Ana where E.E. E. Edwards was and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and why was she charged with a felony when she could have been charged simply with a misdemeanor? I mean, putting a 22 year old away for three years for blocking the tracks on land she thought was her own, and the court thought she was, was her own. Um, she did violate a statute. I'm not sure she knew she violated a statute, but um, nevertheless, I do not understand why several months lapsed between um, the time of her crime and um, her arrest. And there have been several excuses posted that don't make sense, but um, we don't have time here. It, it, it doesn't ring true. Why did he sell 14 acres to Marco Forster, Forster for $5? That's what he got. Um, land was selling for at least 100. Was he borrowing from Forster against the land? That wouldn't have been unusual, and that might be the answer. I don't know that we'll ever know it for sure. But Californios were going out of business right and left because, um, because cattle prices plummeted um, with the um, competition that came for cattle and beef from other locations when the railroad came in to feed the 49ers. Um, <clears throat> there were also a series of droughts that, that killed many of the cattle. So, but what else was in that contract of sale that might have forced Carmen to sell to Forster for such a de minimis, de minimis amount? I don't know. And I got so bored with seeing Modesta's picture that I drew one of my own. And so obviously this is, this doesn't exist. This is, this is, uh, I basically painted in Modesta's face, took away her buttons, and put her next to the railroad depot, which basically came um, several years after she was released from prison, but hey, that's okay. So that's my contribution. Okay, my addendum here is um, a lot of what we talked about in San Juan Capistrano is in my, uh, is in, uh, my novel called Laguna Diary. Um, the painted image here is uh, Old Coast Road by William Went painted in 1916. I've always loved this picture. And so that's why it went on the book. Um, essentially, um, it's a story of a young man who loses his father in the sea, um, gets a stepfather who's not so good. And uh, through a diary that he finds in his garage, um, he learns a lot about his father that he never knew and basically sets him on a new path. Uh, he meets a young girl in Laguna who um, 
uh, basically has her own uh, tale of woe and they, 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 they come together and have all kinds of adventures. Um, she goes to the Paris school in San Juan Capistrano. And so there's a, there's a strong San Juan Capistrano element. And most of it is based on my research um, and time that I spend in San Juan Capistrano researching that. My other book is, um, uh, believe it or not, it's connected because the uh, whole mission system in the Alta California was largely driven by Spain's fear that Russia was going to colonize the Western coast. And um, so I am giving a talk to Osher on this topic, but this covers the fur trade and what they were doing, uh, uh, military interests in colonizing the coast, but most of it relates to the fur trade, uh, but it's from the, obviously from the um, Russian side. So this again, this too, because it's a, it's a novel, is a love story, but it's also historically accurate other than the, most of the characters are fictional. Okay, so that's my little pitch. And there's a summary here for anyone capturing this of most of the points that I made here. Uh, uh, it's, it's basically in, in the um, style of what attorneys do. It's a list of disputed facts uh, across from one another, they're opposing facts. Okay, and that is my talk for tonight. Well, thank you so much. Uh, very interesting. And while, uh, you know, the story we've all grown up knowing uh, may be different from the one you've, you've uncovered, um, it is uh, both, <laughs> both versions are nonetheless fascinating. And, uh, you know, uh, often truth is stranger than fiction. And, uh, and of course, more interesting because it's true. <laughs> So um, I want to let everybody know uh, if you're interested in getting uh, an, a copy of his article, Modesta Again, um, you can email us, email the society at info at orangecountyhistory.com. And uh, um, so uh, please do, I'll, I'll mention that again later. Um, when we get to the end of some of the Q and A, so let's take a quick look at that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, for some reason my computer is, of course, giving me problems. Uh, okay, was Egan mayor of Capistrano? Um, no, um, he was called the, sometimes called the Alcalde, uh, that would be under the Spanish system. Um, he certainly was the leader of the town um, as uh, he, he was elected as justice of the peace. Um, I believe, don't, give, don't quote me on the dates, but it's around 1870. He arrived there in 1867. Um, and he was, he was re-elected Justice of the Peace almost every year until he got uh, too old to do it. Um. <clears throat> okay. um, there's also a, uh, it's a three-part question here. Uh, also, uh, was the land buyer, Marco Forrester, the son of Don Juan Forrester? Don yes, he was. was. Okay. Yes. And Don Juan owned the Capistrano mission, right? He did. Yes, he did. And lived there. And he gave it back to the church uh, under uh, when Lincoln. Okay, so um, didn't Mendelssohn state that he was the station agent in court transcripts? He did, but he was the freight agent. Gotcha. So, okay, it says, uh, let's see. Uh, Chris Jensen, not to be confused with Chris Jepson, writes, by the way, Marcos Forrester was a first cousin, an in-law by his wife, uh, Guadalupe uh, Avila, of Modesta's father, Carmen. Okay. Um, Chris, Chris, Chris supplied the information on the marriage of uh, Modesta um, to Frank Edwards. So thank you. 
what about the Avila Home Adobe in Los Angeles? Is that a relation? I don't have an answer for that. It was oh, I see. Uh, uh, other Chris says, yes, same family, not immediate. Okay. Uh, sorry, I guess there's a lot of these have been answered already. It's going to make your job real easy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I did see a Modesta Avila was sent to county jail in Santa Ana for larceny, June of 1889. Does that relate to her railroad action? Larceny sounds like a different charge. Um, and, and Chris writes back, 30 days petty larceny, June 21st, 1889. Yes, unrelated charge. It was an unrelated charge, correct. Yeah. But it was one of the reasons that some of the newspapers said that she was a, a, a committed criminal. But, but it, when you looked up Penny Larson, Larceny, um, one, of, one of the examples I came up with at the time was someone stole a fork from a, from a dining room table. Oh, okay. Very, yeah. she was also arrested for vagrancy. Um, that was at the time, however, that her mother died and she was arrested with a young girl called Elena. Elena was her sister. So, uh, so, um, and under the, under the vagrancy law, that was basically the greaser law, quote unquote, where, um, where uh, Hispanics and Indians could be arrested for almost no charge at all just by looking cross-eyed. Hmm. Um, this, let's see. This um, however, I... If, I, if I can add one more point, sure. Jim Sleep, in Jim Sleeper's notes, I, I had a chance to review them. Jim Sleeper basically made a note, ah, vagrancy means prostitution. So he, he, he made that connection himself. I, I, dis, I disagreed with it after noting that the girl that was with her wasn't a fellow prostitute. It was her sister and she was only 14 at the time. Although certainly later that term was often used to denote that uh, later in time. So uh, let's see. Uh, every time somebody adds a comment, suddenly my whole thing shifts and I'm at the wrong end of the page. Under the Treaty of Guadalupe. Uh, okay, up one more. Yeah, this being prior to the 19th Amendment, did women in California at this, this time have the right to sign contracts? Uh, uh, Chris again writes, under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the U.S. was required to honor the legal rights of women afforded by Mexico, e.g. community property, contracts, etc. cetera. Um, uh, let's see. It would be very interesting to learn what happened to her after her marriage and find out what happened to her father. Can't argue with that. I agree. Still working. Uh, yeah. Well, that's the great thing about history. There is always more story to be dug out. We, you never run out of uh, uh, jobs to do. Um, do we know anything about her husband? That is where he was from, what he was in prison for, how long he served? Um, he was, he, uh, he was, I think he had a three year sentence. Um, it was for um, theft. And I believe it was a clock, but don't quote me. He was much older than her and he was from Germany. Hmm. So there were several Frank Edwards in prison with her at the time. <clears throat> Um, and they were shuffling sometimes back and forth between uh, between state prisons. Um, the other one, like, the, the location escapes me at the, for the moment. But the only one that, that, that actually overlapped with her in time and would have had access to her at prison was a Frank Edwards that basically went to jail for a, a nonviolent crime. And I believe he got out on an early out for good behavior as well. And Chris writes, Frank Edwards' basics are in the San Quentin re records available on Ancestry. So yes. for those who want to go do some digging on their own. Um, uh, Mr. Brock, will your books be available on CD audio? No. Come on, you got to get some famous actor to read it for you. You know, Patrick Stewart would be great or, you know... <laughs> 
somebody who does a lot of that. Uh, let's see. Was the 1850 census mentioned in the presentation of American or Mexican census? Uh, the 1850 census was a U.S. census because it was already the U.S. Yeah. Um, there was an 1846, I believe they call it a padron. Um, and um, I did get some information from that and it is available. Um, I use uh, a genealogist who is something akin to um, the folks that um, basically uh, transcribed all of the uh, mission records. Um, their name escapes me for the moment, but um, they, uh, this, this particular gen gentleman is called Schwald. Um, and if you, uh, S-C-H-W-A-L-D, and you wouldn't think from his name that he would have uh, a lot of information on Hispanics, but he does. He's incredible. He's done an, an amazing amount of work um, and pulled up things like um, these uh, Spanish censuses, like the Padron for Los Angeles and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and um, he's gone through them and link them with people that he has in, in this huge database. Anyway, it's free and it's online. I highly recommend it. All right. Modesta's parents marked with an X. Could they have not understood the contract? And was Modesta illiterate? No, Modesta was not. Actually, Modesta and her sister Elena were, were, were literate. And one of the reasons that some people have said that the jury was against them was that they were uppity women, especially Mexican women. And so um, the fact that they could read was, was theorized to be against them, but no, they were not illiterate. Obviously, Carmen and Juliana were, but that wasn't unusual for the time either. Uh, somebody says, are the Avila El Ranchito restaurants somehow connected? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, one, of the, one of the beauties of dealing in, in, in this particular time space is that, um, I, mean, I mean, Los Angeles, during some of the, 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 the censuses and the, and the documented information, had 1,500 people total. So when Josefa is consorting with some of these male, males and, and having children, you, you, can, you can find their houses, I mean, literally. So it was a small place. Right. So, and, and, and you go back far enough in California history into that era. If you go back far enough, if you had a relative, you know, uh, uh, one of your, your ancestors lived here at that time, and you, you were also related to darn near everybody else. So <laughs> you, once you got bragging rights with one interesting uh, early California figure, you probably have you know, a ton of interesting people from that era in your, in your tree. That, um, that applies to San Juan Capistrano in, in particular. Oh, I, yes. I remember the yeah. first researcher I met there, he was almost, almost looked, looked pale, frightened. He says, the whole town is related. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. One member sent this question to me as a DM, I think on accident. Oh, uh, what happened to Modesta Avila's sister and what was her name? Sister? Yeah. Uh, well, she had several siblings. Um, I didn't track all of them. I don't know what happened to her. Maybe talking about Elena you mentioned earlier. Okay. But, um, do we know what happened to Elena at all or... Um, no, I haven't, I, I really haven't tracked the children okay. down. Okay. Um, and again, yeah, okay. And, um, yeah, who is the other author mentioned at the beginning of the presentation? I think that Elizabeth Haas, it starts with an L, L I. Z B E T H. Yes. Yeah. It's the -E -S. Santa Cruz. Yeah. Um, and she um, basically is the authority on much of what we call the, the 
conquest, uh, the European conquest of the Americas. Absolutely. Um, so let's see. Mod uh, Modesto was my fourth. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm skipping some again. Because again, every time somebody adds a question, it bumps everything and I get thrown back to the beginning and I have to find my way here. Um, Modesto was uh, imprisoned in LA County Jail uh, for 30 days. No? Do you know where she was arrested? She, well, she was, but L LA, remember that LA County and Los Angeles County, right? Los, Orange County was Los Angeles County until March 11th. Well, technically April, August 1st, but yeah. Well, actually that came up as, as, as one of the points in the argument for a new trial. Um, the lawyer argued essentially that um, she couldn't be tried in Orange County because at the time of the, uh, uh, what was it? At the time of she's the- Basically, she's, basically the, the argument was that Orange County didn't have jurisdiction to, to try her for her act because of the timing of when it was really, really a county. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that works with, with either date, but yeah, August 1st is where, you know, we switch over and we have our own government and we have our own courts and all of that stuff. But, uh, but that, that also plays with that, uh, with the rest of the story. Um, let's see. Uh, did Modesta live out her life in Northern California or did she return to Orange County? We don't know. Yeah. She didn't, she never returned as far as we know, to, particularly to San Juan Capistrano. And um, I'm still in touch with people in San Juan um, and they have their own theories, by the way. Uh, but um, uh, she never returned to San Juan Capistrano according to locals. Do we know if Modesta ever took her husband's last name, Modesta Edwards? We do not know that. Okay, and does Modesta's home still remain? Did her parents home survive uh, we don't know that either fair enough well unless there are any other questions i will just point out again then that uh if you would like a copy of uh of his article there uh do send us an email at info at orangecountyhistory.com and uh, we'll get you set up so um uh, it's it's definitely well worth a read. I mean, it's uh, because what uh, what you've learned tonight is the uh, sort of the the beginner version. It's the uh, it's the the overview, but there's you know much more detail to be had. And uh, as you think of other questions, uh, <laughs> you know, an hour after this meeting is over, uh, or tomorrow, or the day after, uh, a lot of those questions are undoubtedly going to be answered in the article. So. Um, Thank you so much for, for coming and do the, doing this and a um, oh, wonderful program. And I'd like to, to thank everyone who attended this evening. And I, I hope we will see you all back here uh, next month. We have uh, David James Gonzalez. We'll be talking about the Yost Theater in downtown Santa Ana. And, um, and uh, we will see you then. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure.